My name is Eric Askins. My pronouns are he and him, and I am the executive director for admissions for the full-time MBA program at the Haas School of Business here at UC Berkeley. The full-time program receives around 4,000 applications each cycle, give or take. Now that can sometimes be affected by things going on in the marketplace. Obviously, uh, the pandemic has had an outsized effect on that application volume, but generally speaking, uh, we're looking at about 4,000 applications each year. As an institution, I think our selectivity is typically hovered between 17 and 20%. Uh, we're looking probably at about 17% this year. And generally speaking, our target really is to be in and around that range. So the first and foremost is we are uh, constrained by law here in the state of California in terms of incorporating any type of identity in our evaluative process. So that is not part of our evaluation at all. And what is part of our our institution is a focus on an equity fluent leader. And what is an equity fluent leader? It's a leader that's prepared for the future that we find ourselves in. A future that is increasingly remote and distributed. A future in which leaders will lead people from across uh, global diversity, from various backgrounds, various uh, understandings, various uh, academic spaces and we try and bring that into focus in what we talk about in our outreach in our recruitment it is that equity fluency that we hope to put out into the marketplace and recognize that that's an, a value of a strong leader in the future and so how do we do that how do we connect that we do that through an authentic outreach we do that through allowing members of our community who hold diverse identities to partner with us in admissions to talk about their experiences we also, within our own shop, focus on making sure that we are consistent in our messaging. The one thing that I find uh, off-putting is if you engage with an admissions office and you'll find that they'll have one set of things that they lean into in one type of setting, and then you meet them in another venue and they're leaning into something a little bit different. What you'll find with us is we are mission-oriented and we use these four defining leadership principles which are core to the cultural uh, values here at HOTS. And we use that as the framework for our outreach and our recruitment, no matter where you find us. Within our community, we focus on a couple of things. We focus on, and I will fully admit, we didn't invent these ideas, but they are part of how we think about how we share our community and how we express its values. Uh, those four defining leadership principles include always going beyond yourself, pushing yourself beyond simply the impact on your own life, but the impact on your community more broadly. Questioning the status quo, something that's incredibly valuable in the current business climate, where we are seeing shifts in leadership and shifts and changes, and just saying, well, this is the way it's been done, but is this the way it should be done going forward? We also talk about being a student always, focusing in on always learning, always iterating, always growing, for us, a leader has never reached their destination. There's always opportunity to grow and learn. And the last one, and it's, it isn't last by uh, just by the way that I framed it, is confidence without attitude. And that one is a little bit of harder to sort of encapsulate, but I'll share a little bit of what we think that that might reflect. And it has to do with the idea that we know our strengths. We recognize where we're strong, but we recognize also where we can learn. Right? That's the confidence without that, or confidence with humility is another way of framing it. Um, it is leaders who are active listeners, uh, people who are willing to take in new information, who recognize that they have areas of growth and how to build on those. Now, these are the four defining leadership principles. They're not separate. Right? That's one of the biggest things. We really do see them intertwine in our student communities. We never in our application process want to see someone say, well, I, I espouse confidence without attitude in the following two ways. And I go beyond myself in the following one way. They are a touchstone for us in our communication about the culture and the values of this institution. So in particular, we have two essays that are uh, required essays in our application. Now I'll lean into that second essay, which is our leadership essay. That essay actually asks for an opinion from the candidate. What does a good leader look like? And by doing that, 
Uh, what we're asking you is to bring your values forward. Tell us what a good leader looks like. We don't expect the same answer from everyone. That's the beauty of this. We don't expect everyone to say a good leader looks like the following one, two, three things. We hope that we're going to get a variety of responses. And then the second part of that essay is then now tell us how you get there, right? Set a goal, set a values oriented goal and tell us how you can achieve those goals. That's a way that an individual can espouse their values in our application process using the model that we've laid forward as a means for them to sort of use for their own application. These are my, my values. This is what I think leadership should be. And this is how I get there. Within the admissions framework here at Berkeley Haas, we start by first taking every application and it gets a full and complete review by a team of readers. And we use contract readers for this first review who have developed a specificity in a particular area. So we divide our applications by those uh, areas where they completed their undergraduate degree. And this is by region of the globe. And then we subdivide by profession. And we do that for two reasons. One, we want to make sure that our readers are comfortable understanding the transcript of the area of the globe where someone has completed their degree. That's important because translations of GPAs or a quick overview that says, okay, this is this is the, the academic strength of this candidate isn't really sufficient for us. We want to see compared to other people who've studied in Italy, what does the academic uh, path look like? We want to have those comparison sets. We want to have a set of comparison against the last three years worth of data we have for people who come from that background, from that area of the globe. We do the same when it comes to the professional journey. What does job progression look like in this particular industry? How does this individual stand against the last three years worth of job progression for that industry that we've seen in our application volume? It gives us some sense of where a candidate sits within the framework of their larger peers. The second thing that we do is we then take those first reads and they get a second read. And that second read is done by members of our staff. These are the admissions committee members. These are the people that you'll see on our website. These are the people that you'll see um, doing our events and recruiting when we have the opportunity to recruit, um, you know, in person, but in the meantime, virtually for the time being. And each of those folks, they reread those applications. It's a second full read. They don't just follow through with that first reader has written out. Now, what they're looking for is a set of competencies. Those competencies could be academic readiness, quantitative aptitude, leadership attributes, these broader components that exist in the application. If there's an alignment between the first reader and the second reader, uh, and that alignment is positive, we'll move that person onto an interview process. If there's a misalignment between that first reader and a second reader, we'll bring a third reader in to weigh it so that we do get a complete and holistic view. We give people the benefit of the doubt and the opportunity to get a full review of their entire applications. Once that's completed, those candidates have gone up to interview, we'll complete an interview process. We have two different ways that you can do that. We have a pre-recorded interview. So to, in this universe of virtual and not knowing when you're going to be, uh, have the opportunity to kind of be uh, alone in a room with a camera and good sound and good lighting, we wanna give people that flexibility other than locking them into timetables that are typically US based or West Coast time zone based. We wanna give that flexibility out there. But we also offer virtual interviews that are with a live individual so that there's different modalities, but ultimately what it ends up with is an interview assessment. This assessment coupled with the reviews that we've talked about earlier, come into an admissions committee for deliberation. Typically it's that person that did that second read who takes the role as an advocate and they advocate that candidate to the larger group in these committees. And ultimately the goal here is for the rest of the committee to explore that application, determine where the strengths are, to point out where we think there might be some weaknesses, to discuss how those weaknesses either are dispositive to the candidate's journey or they're not. And then ultimately we uh, yield a decision. It's seldom that someone will lose an opportunity if they have a poor interview. Now we train all of our interviewers. Uh, we do an anti-bias training. We also do a training on not bringing your own expectations into those interview processes. We have to recognize that they are conducted by individuals as opposed to against the baseline. So part of that is to understand a little bit more about how we might value that interview. The second piece of that puzzle 
has to do with a candidate's presentation. Now, uh, not everyone's comfortable in front of a video camera. Not everyone's going to have this quiet space with decent lighting and no outside distractions. We have to recognize that people are in a lot of, you know, in a variety of, of situations. It isn't the same as it was when you could, you know, put on your best business casual, meet someone in a coffee shop, have an hour to prepare beforehand. You know, that's just not the way the world is currently operating. And so we do grant that those interviews may not be the best representation of the individual. However, where someone can shine in an interview has to do with, are they reinforcing what they've shared with us already in the application? Are they giving us a better depth of understanding of their journey? Are they introducing new information that reflects well on what they've already provided or provides the level of depth that we need? In many cases, our interview process is an exploration of an example from their professional journey, what they learned from that example, and how they can articulate what they've learned to us. That's the competencies that we look for with these questions. And so if we're getting the, the piece that we want, which is an understanding of their learning journey and the way that they communicate that journey, it's okay if the example is off or if the example is strong, but their presentation is weaker, we can still get some of those pieces. So it isn't a, it's seldom that an interview will tank a candidate's trajectory. Uh, oftentimes it's a, it's a value add for candidates who might be on the cusp for us. In both of our in-person and our pre-recorded interviews, we actually have a question bank. We have a set of questions that get asked. They're the same question bank. So you're going to get different questions, but they often apply to the same competencies. Different framings of what could draw different types of examples, but ultimately the goal here is to have some consistency across the process. Now, I think you're right to say that in some cases, the development of a rapport with another individual could be helpful in those interviews, but uh, it's often, and I'll present you the counterfactual, which is you, you're you misaligned with the individual that you you sit across from. You know, you, uh, you reach out, you notice a guitar on their wall and you ask about the guitar before you get started. And, now all of a sudden they think that you're frivolous or they don't uh, they don't think that you came prepared for those things but you don't always know how things will be re received by another human or another individual and so as much as the rapport is a value add it also you know as soon as you introduce the human component it can go either way uh, and so we, we do value the pre-recorded for those people who um who might be thrown off by another individual. I think you've talked a little bit about sort of cultural engage, you know, cultural values and how they play through in interview processes. There are probably those for whom a pre-recorded interview best fits their preparation. In a very macro sense, everybody is being asked in an application process to surface their strongest attributes. That's that's not wrong. Uh, but one of those attributes we're asking you to surface is self-reflection, is that exploration of oneself and where you can grow. If you have no areas of growth, what do you need the business program for, right? In some in some ways, you're, you're looking to tell us why this is valuable as a step in your journey. Now, an MBA program is very much not just a program that introduces business fundamentals. It's a leadership accelerator. And in order to be a strong leader, you need to know where do you need to grow. And so I think the strength area that one can present, given the framework that I've just described, is the strength of introspection. One of the biggest things that we are searching for, and I think one of the biggest challenges for an applicant, especially in the written materials that, that uh, supplement the application, is self-reflection and then what I think is the harder step, curation, right? Self-reflection is taking a look at your own journey and saying, okay, what is my narrative? What am I hoping to share with you as an admissions committee? And curation, well, now that I've looked at my journey, there are a thousand different strains of who I am. None, none of us, I think, is just one thing, right? We're, it, it, I'm a, I'll use myself as an example. I'm a parent, uh, you know, I also love the work that I do. I support my team but I also have hobbies and things that I like to pursue. I'm not just this one 
thread. And yet what we're asking for you is a clear narrative. So you're going to have to curate. Parts of your journey are going to have to fall to the floor. I believe that many of the candidates who apply to us are able to do that self-reflection and that curation, either independently or more likely through the support of others more broadly. Now, not everyone has that support network around them to give them quality feedback and support. And so we don't necessarily look unfavorably on those people that choose to get that support, help with that curation, help with that self-reflection, have that process guided by uh, consultants or prep programs or a number of the variety of, of things that live in the ecosystem that support uh, applications to business school. What I will say is if that curation uh, leaves authenticity on the floor, it's a disservice to the candidate. Uh, and that, that doesn't always come through in the application. I, I'll i admit to seeing journeys that are very similar to other people's journeys and maybe taking a moment to wonder. But generally speaking, I'm sad for the candidate if the structure provided by their support eliminates their individual identity, takes away from the authenticity of the application. That's not gonna serve them well in our review process. Our volume and the uh, the way in which we, we, we conduct our work doesn't allow for us to give individualized feedback. And what we do do is we do hold at least once or twice a year a reapplication workshop for people who are applying for a future year. Uh, we do want to give people the opportunity to know a little bit more about what does reapplying look like? What are the strength areas? One of the things that we'd love to say is that uh, reapplicants to our program have a higher rate of admission than the general applicant pool. And that's true. Uh, oftentimes, because a reapplicant is one, shown a resilience or grit to recommit to the program, they've shown a deep interest in our program specifically by, by taking the opportunity to reapply. Oftentimes, they've done that self assessment said, I have a sense, I generally have a sense of what was missed, uh, a refinement of the career goal, a strengthening of their professional journey. Oftentimes it's just adding another year worth of professional experience to, to support their application. In some cases, they recognize that they submitted a test that was not a best expression of their skills or abilities, and they have the opportunity to give more energy and effort to their testing. And so those are the reasons why we've seen some strength in those reapplicants. But you also introduce another population, which are those folks who were waitlisted in our program. Now, I will say every single year that I've been here, and my understanding is prior to me coming here, we have taken people from our waitlist. Uh, it is not a uh, it is not a holding place for those candidates who are ultimately going to be denied. If you make it to our waitlist, it's a reflection that we, at least in that first and that second reader, saw some strengths there, some competencies that we thought would make you a strong student within our program, but with the size of our program, being one of the smallest in our tier, around 300 students each year, we simply don't have space for every every strong candidate. And so some candidates will be placed in this peer, play, it's a wait list, I like to call it a hold, uh, until we can see the full breadth of the applicant pool, uh, and then come on back to some of those strong candidates and give them the opportunity. What I can say is every person placed on our wait list will be given an opportunity to interview if they haven't already because we do think that that's an important component to add to our understanding of their applicant journey. We have a lot of engaged on-campus communities, uh, and one of them is probably the most structured one, which is why you've seen so many videos, is our on-campus veterans community. Now, one of the biggest things that I think often gets lost in, our, uh, in the way that we describe our community is when we talk about diversity of perspective, we will often, in order, talk about our global diversity, talk about our uh, diversity of underrepresented communities from the United States. We'll talk about our diversity of professional perspective. Uh, what we won't all, often talk about is our diversity of professional background, which includes uh, the very unique set of circumstances that comes from military veterans and from their particular journey. Uh, but we do consider that one of the aspects that strengthens our community. We think that there's a unique set of circumstances that comes from people who come from that background, and we empower our student groups to be able to share on that journey. Uh, and it happens to be that we have so many videos because that particular set of student group is 
uh, among the most put together, uh, which I don't find surprising. Because professional experience and professional growth and what that job progression looks like is a little bit different in those settings. You'll oftentimes, and I do this because we do little reports on um, the number of direct reports that someone has had. And typically you'll see five for this person, three for this person, and then someone will have 120. 120, you're like, 120 direct reports, that must be a, a military candidate. Uh, because they do end up with responsibility for a lot of individuals. Uh, and that brings with it its own set of values that add to our community. Um, it also oftentimes is associated with a, um, a sense of service towards community. And so we see those factors there. It's not a unique evaluative process, but it is, it is one that we um, are aware of. And oftentimes when we talk about sort of comparing against peers, the best peer set to compare is other folks coming from a military background. We are independent, but we often think about our placement within the larger uh, UC system and certainly within the UC Berkeley campus as our Berkeley advantage. And why do I say that? It's because not only are we able to provide what is one of the smallest programs within our tier, which is this robust community where you get to know everyone, we then plug you into an ecosystem that includes top 10 programs in almost every field, a top 10 law school, top 10 engineering school, top 10 public policy school, top 10 high school. And our students have that interaction, that ability to communicate across. So every one of our students gets up to six credits that they can take outside of our program. Many students take it in computer science to develop that skill set or uh, public policy to understand uh, public private partnerships in a better way. But every one of those students gets that same six credit grace, which typically amounts to two classes that they can take in another program. And so you will find that some of your business courses will have students from these other programs as well. Again, bringing in that broad perspective. Within the application process, there is nothing that the campus requirements impact our, our student application requirements, except for a requirement for an English language proficiency test which is not part of our evaluation at the business school, but is an eligibility requirement to apply that the campus sets. That's the that's probably the one space where they have influence. I would love to take a pause here. I think uh, we spent a lot of time talking about what a culture forward program we are. How academically rigorous are we? Well, we were academically rigorous to be a top 10 program for a considerable period of time. Or what access to professional opportunities exists? Well, we, you know, we place in the top three consulting firms at the same rate as many of our peer sets. We have the strongest investment banking internship placement of any business school here on the West Coast. Right? These are pieces that I um, are so incredibly important to our so many people who are applying. I know that many people think about, well, what is the student experience that I'm gonna have on campus? I believe I've probably done a lot to answer that question, but the, uh, the more fundamental question, which is I'm attending business school to achieve a professional objective. I wanna make sure that people have an opportunity to understand the strength areas for folks to be able to do that, whether they, those goals be entrepreneurial uh, in our broad innovation ecosystem that exists here, both from an ideation phase through uh, the, the creation of companies through uh, the development uh, and, and uh, fundraising components of that, all the way through to the number of people who graduate from our program who go into startups to start their own business, which is typically between 12 and 15% each year. Take a look at our employment reports, uh, take a look at our areas of emphasis, get a, a, a good understanding of the professional opportunities that are available for you through our program.